that work? I don't know. I think maybe this looks better if you're on a computer. It's a... Uh, I'm just going to move this guy down here. So here I am uh, in widescreen format. Maybe that looks better on computers. Um, good. JDO can hear me and see me. Okay, you guys can, uh, Sergio can see me okay? Um, yeah, I mean, I have had other issues. Uh, another issue that I had uh, yesterday or the day before, uh, when I uploaded one of my YouTube videos, it took way longer than normally. So uh, that was just another confirmation for me that I'm having, you know, internet uh bandwidth issues um someone said so oh ledger live um ledger live uh for me i'll uh i'll just give you this story what, what am i i guess i should be looking down over there the camera's over there right uh ledger live has an issue uh for me um and i just thought that perhaps it was uh because uh i overdo it with wallets. I think we've talked about this before that my view is that a wallet that is never sent out is more secure than a wallet that has sent an outgoing transaction. When you create a, a wallet, a Bitcoin, we'll just use Bitcoin as an example. When you create a Bitcoin wallet, uh, you your public key has not been exposed to the internet. You can uh, give out a uh, sending address, but sending addresses are derived from your public key. Uh, you don't actually send people your public key when you uh, ask them you know, to send Bitcoin or you initiate a transfer from an exchange, right? Those are not your public keys. Those are... Uh, sending addresses, which get derived from your public key. So if the Bitcoin wallet only uh, sends in, right? If you have no outgoing transactions, then you have never exposed your public key to the blockchain or the internet, right? Uh, because when you send an outgoing transaction, your public key actually gets attached to verify that it's you. It's part of the pub public private key encryption. I may just be crazy, but in my view, a, an, an, a, a send only wallet, a wallet that has only received Bitcoin is more secure than a wallet that has gone in and out. So I uh, constantly create new wallets. And then if I have to send my Bitcoin out, uh, I will wipe that wallet and create a brand new wallet. But I'm only talking about like the long-term storage wallets, right? I have working wallets that I know Bitcoin's going in and out of, and that's not a big deal because I'm not storing huge amounts of Bitcoin in those. Anyway, uh, because I have so many wallets for myself and when I do a demo, I'll create a wallet, maybe a, just for the demo, and then... Uh, after the demo's over, I'll empty the wallet out and then I'll just forget about it. I'll never use it again. So because I have so many wallets with so many transactions in and out over the years, uh, I synced up a couple months back, I was syncing up uh, a Ledger Nano and the balances were way off, way, way off. And... Uh, I was like, this is not right. You know, these, I know there's no Bitcoin left in these wallets. Uh, but I thought, well, maybe somebody threw some Bitcoin in there or whatever. And so I tried to send some of that, that phantom Bitcoin to one of my working wallets and it, it failed, right? So I had one particular wallet that I've been using since at least 2018, maybe before that, right? 
that was not syncing up in Ledger Live. It said that I had about $1,000 worth of Bitcoin in it, and I knew that I did not. And it stayed that way for a really long time. And I cleared my cash. I did everything that I normally would do. Uh, you know, reinstalled Ledger Live clean, clean, you know, all the tricks that I know. And it's still, for weeks, was still saying that the balance in that wallet was like $1,000 worth of Bitcoin, which I knew was not correct. And then finally, uh, last week or like two weeks, less than two weeks ago, it suddenly synced up and was working fine again. Go figure. So uh, I don't know if uh, Ledger Live uh, was having trouble syncing to the blockchain. Okay, so you put it on your laptop and it worked fine. Uh, one of Ledger Live developers could uh, program a backdoor with an update. They could steal our private keys and all our crypto. No, uh, I mean, a lot of people think that. But the way the device is designed, it generates a private key locally. There's no hack to like reach in and grab the private key out of the device. It's a secure device. It's been tested by third parties. Uh, if people were, if Ledger was stealing private keys, uh, we would have heard about it. Um, people would be complaining that their Bitcoin is disappearing. Um, I know it seems like they could do something like that, but they can't. The device generates the private key locally. Uh, there are no back doors in, built into the firmware. Actually, uh, well, Ledger Live is open source. There, there is a bit of proprietary uh, firmware on the device itself. Uh, just by the way that it works. Uh, so it's not completely open source. Uh, but yeah, I, I don't think that that could happen. You know, nothing is, Ledger Live Sync is horrible. Uh, I just wanted to point out to you guys that I uh, got this um, one key touch from the people at one key. Uh, it's a pretty cool little wallet. It's very similar to what I would think is the, uh, why am I, why can't I look at you guys? I'm looking straight at you. Yeah, it's weird because <laughs> if I look at the camera, then I'm not looking at my face. And if I look at my face, then my eyes are averting away from you. <laughs> it's just bizarre. Okay. All right, so I'm going to enter my pin on this thing. And to, I think you guys can see it right side up. To me, it looks like a mirror image. I can't read it. Uh, but it's interesting in that... Oop, oop, oh, you got to swipe up. There's only uh, three apps on it. There's like a help app, you know, that has help stuff, user guide. There's a settings app that, you know, you can uh, do the settings in the wallet and reset your pin and all that stuff. Uh, and then when I updated the firmware, there was a uh, NFT gallery. So uh, this thing's pretty cool. But it uh, you don't see the balance on it, right? But you do see uh, readouts when you're sending transactions out. Um, I don't have any right now. Well, actually, I think I can, I can cheat. Uh, by uh, opening up the desktop app. Uh, as far as XDC, uh, where you can store XDC in a wallet, um, there is an XDC app that you can download for your phone. Uh, now, that is a phone-based wallet. It's not ledger-based. Um, and you can store XDC on that app in native format. However, you can use my crypto. Dot com to store XDC. When you go through the setup in uh, mycrypto.com, uh, you, uh, when you connect your device, you switch from the Ethereum network to the XDC network, 
and then you can safely manage XDC using your Ledger device. That is a third-party app that works with the Ledger to store XDC. Um, however, it does store it in the uh, address format that starts with a 0x instead of the XDC at the beginning of the address. Uh, but XDC claims that the, the beginning of the address is interchangeable. Like if you have an address for XDC that starts with little letter X, little letter D, letter, little letter C, and then a whole bunch of numbers, you can take those three letters off and replace it with a zero X, and it's the same address. It's interchangeable, although I find that really kind of bizarre, but they say that's how it works. All right, so uh, let me see. I'm going to uh, do a receive and see if this thing will, yeah, what's it gonna do? There, see, uh, this is what it looks like when you verify an address, like when you check. Okay, here we go. And then I can hit done. Right, so that's, uh, I mean, the, the interface on this thing is really cool. The letters are nice and big and readable, and uh, when you do a send, it's very similar to the Trezor T. I'll have to say that the Trezor T has been a touchscreen uh, private key device for quite some time. It's very underrated. Um, I guess the biggest problem with the, the um, Trezor is that for some reason, it's just not supported as widely as the ledger devices so there are a lot of third-party wallets like phantom that support ledger device but not trezor uh, but uh, metamask supports trezor now uh, i don't know about the uh, third-party wallet support for this device i would hope that they get more of it yeah but uh, it does work pretty well with its own app on the desktop, and then there's also a phone app that you can use. And uh, you can manage crypto in there, and you can send and receive, and they also have some swap abilities, And but I don't think I've tried to connect to uh, uh, Uniswap or PancakeSwap or anything like that. But you can swap like within, not on this device, I mean, this is just the private key. Uh, Descent, that's the one that you can use to manage XDC. W trusted by who? Trusted is a very um, nebulous term that people throw around. Uh, a it's almost as overused as the word safe in crypto. Uh, a lot of people use that term, and like when they talk about a ledger device or ledger live or any wallet, they'll go, is it safe? <laughs> And I don't know what they mean by that. You know, does safe mean 100% foolproof, um, idiot proof? You know, there's a lot of terms for the word safe. Um, I guess the answer to, you know, whether most hardware wallets and software wallets are safe is uh, whether it, they're used properly. Um, if the end user reveals their backup phrase, then it's not safe anymore. Right. Um, although uh, a hardware device is safer by virtue of the fact that the private key is stored on the device offline, not connected to the rest of the wallet. Um, now, uh, they, they do like the ledger has a cable. Right. And then people go, oh, can't hackers like go through the cable and grab your crypto? Well, that's not how it works. Right. The cable is only there to send messages back and forth. Right. And it's cryptography. Right. There's no code going back and forth. It's just there's a request, uh, you know, a properly formatted cryptographic request goes across the cable to the device. The device gets the request. It's a properly formatted request for, you know, to send crypto or, or, you know, whatever it happens to be. It might be request to verify address or whatever. The, the device uh, verifies the address or authorizes the outgoing transaction internally using the private key. And then the only thing that the device sends back is an approval. 
right? So there's no code going back and forth. There's no back doors going back and forth. There's a request and an approval, right? Nothing else can go across. Nothing else is recognized, right? There's no long, crazy strings like you can do with a web page, right? You could do like crazy, like instead of entering a web address, you can enter this really long kind of script that might jack a website, but that's not how these devices work, right? They're expecting properly formatted cryptographic requests and approvals. So anybody that tries to send gobbledygook, it's gonna be rejected because there's a hash at the beginning of the, the request. And if the fails, the hash fails, then it just gets rejected, right? It's not like a normal web page or a phone device, an app, you know, it's, it's different than that. Anyway, I'm having trouble reading all of your, uh, okay, here we go. Okay. How can I receive crypto from my friend's Binance account to my Ledger cold ETH wallet? Well, uh, you send your friend your Ethereum address, right? You go into your Ethereum wallet and you generate, you do a receive and get that uh, address. You send it to your friend, either by email or text. And then your friend goes into his Binance account and does a withdrawal. And then when it asks him, you know, the withdrawal address, he pastes in your address, the one you sent him. It's the same when you're, you know, uh, making a withdrawal on your own behalf, right? You might shoot yourself an email with the address if you're on your phone, or you just might cut and paste your address on your desktop between your Ledger Live and your Binance account. It's the same concept. If you want to send your friend your wallet address, then he can send you crypto. All right. Yeah, this is kind of weird doing this on my phone. Uh, <laughs> hey, Crypto Dad, is the Trezor Model T viable to store Hex? Hex is a scam. Please don't talk about Hex. Uh, always try with a small amount to make sure. Very good, Dave. Thank you. That is That could solve uh, a million heartaches in a heartbeat. How's that for poetic? waxing poetic. Always send small test transactions to make sure uh, that your transaction is going to go through and do what you expect before you send huge amounts, right? It would, it's like a, a million heartaches would get solved if people just remembered that. That's just such a simple little thing that could solve so many problems. Uh, love your content. Any thoughts on Insta D app? And I've never heard of Insta D app. Uh, let's see, get this out of the way. Uh, okay, so anything like uh, a trading bot, I, I don't trust them from the get-go. If they're talking about maximizing your DeFi products across multiple sites and multiple chains, they're talking about you transferring your crypto to them so that they can trade and do all this stuff for you. That is not self-custody. All of those little schemes where they're going to do all the trading where you just sit back and relax. You don't have to do anything except send your crypto to them. Red well, alarm bells should be going off in your head. There may It's possible there may be some legitimate firms doing that, but most of them are scams. Right? Don't send your crypto to someone else to manage. If you want to have someone else manage your assets for you, then, you know, open, uh, go to uh, Merrill Lynch or uh, JP Morgan Chase and like give them 50 grand of your money and let them manage your portfolio for you. 
If that's what, if you just want to sit back and relax, then maybe you should be, you know, dealing with these firms. They're reputable. They're uh, regulated, supposedly, right? Uh, if, if you want to trust your money to somebody else, that'd be the way to go. Not some rinky-dink, uh, brand-new crypto platform with AI that's going to, like, manage your assets for you. I wouldn't do it. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, that's... Your term is legit. Uh, my term is non... Is... Uh, you're storing your assets in someone else's care. So, yeah. yeah. But that's my opinion. Someone asked me what my opinion was, and I don't do that. Best life advice this fine Sunday. <laughs> Trust in the Lord with all of your heart and lean not to thine own understanding. <laughs> Oops, I'm having trouble with this interface. I don't trust crypto with my wife. Any thoughts on Hedra Hashbar? Uh, I had a lot of people asking me about Hedra Hashbar. I don't really know that much about it, what its uh, use case is. Uh, I do have a little bit. Uh, just because people kept asking me about it, I figured maybe it had there was something going on. Uh, it is supported in Ledger Live now. If you want to use Hedra Hashgraph and store it in Ledger Live, you can do that. So, uh, yes, uh, but like I said, I don't know that much about Hedra. You know, I know a lot about Bitcoin and Ethereum and Cardano and all these other big cryptos, but uh, I don't know what the particular use case for Hedra Hashgraph is, although I do own some. And it seems to be doing fairly well over the last, you know, month or so. Any thoughts on connecting your crypto wallets to tax software program API? Yeah, I do have some thoughts on that. Um, I've done several videos on uh, how to use several different types of crypto tax software. Um, and I also did an interview with uh, a tax accountant who specializes in crypto. And uh, the one... Uh, comment that I get a lot on those videos is, oh, uh, you're, you're really compromising your privacy by giving out all of your wallet addresses. And that is a true statement. Yes, you are. You are compromising your privacy by giving up your private keys to an, another entity, but you are not giving up your security by doing that. The, the, the whole, uh, the way crypto works is you can give out your public address without compromising your private key. That's how crypto works. That's the beauty of public private key cryptography. You are not sacrificing security by giving out your public blockchain addresses. Uh, but you are compromising your privacy. But what is the alternative, Right. Uh, what I wanted to reply to all those people that say those, you know, oh, what about your privacy? Uh, is, well, what is, what is your plan? Uh, the IRS doesn't care about your privacy, right? So if you want to deal directly with the IRS and do your taxes manually and uh, get an Excel spreadsheet, you still have to provide the IRS with every single transaction. And I don't know if the IRS uh, capital gains form when you fill out crypto trades uh, requires you to include the address of the wallet. It might not, right? You might just be, you might, you know, you're gonna, but you have to include every single transaction, right? You have to say, uh, I made a trade on Binance. I swapped Bitcoin for Ethereum, right? That that's how they you calculate your your capital gains, right? You give them your cost basis and your sell price or whatever. 
But if you transfer it to a wallet, you have to include your wallet. You have to say, okay, I moved my crypto from my exchange to my wallet. That way they know that it wasn't a sale, right? And then later you might say, well, I moved my crypto from my wallet back to my exchange so that I could liquidate. Well, you have to, you have to let them know that it was from this wallet. I don't know if you can just tell them, oh yeah, well, I can't, it came from my wallet to the exchange. And then they just trust you on that, right? There's a lot of stuff that the IRS just trusts you on because you just say, oh, well, I made this money and, you know, I'm, I'm declaring it, right? So there is an element of trust with the IRS. But I don't know for sure if you can file your taxes and manually do everything without revealing any of your public keys to the IRS. Um... Although it might look kind of weird, you know, uh, they might look at all your transactions and think, um, this guy needs to be audited because, you know, he's not giving us any information. We have no idea whether, you know, so I don't know. Uh, but trying to do your crypto taxes, if you have thousands and thousands of transactions in and out of your wallets and on your exchanges and is... I don't know that uh, anybody uh, can do that without some kind of software, right? Or analyzing blockchain data, right? Because that's what the tax accountant was telling me is that uh, he, uh, when they get their clients, they, they, uh, they have them do API. There's nothing unsafe about APIs. When you uh, set up an API on an exchange, uh, you can set up the API to be read only, right? So there's no compromise of your security. Uh, there's also ways to make APIs tradable where they're, they're, it, you do give them some auth authorization. That's bot stuff, right? But when you're doing tax APIs just for downloading your transactions, those are read only, right? So you're not compromising your security. Uh, but you are giving all that information over to a third party, be it your tax accountant, if your tax accountant knows how to handle all that stuff, or if you're doing it through Coin Tracker or uh, Coinly or Coin Ledger or any other kind of tax software, yeah, you're you are compromising your privacy to a certain extent by revealing your wallet addresses. But what is your alternative to not pay your taxes? Uh, that's risky. So if you want to pay your taxes and you are not uh, a math whiz uh, who's going to sit there and create Excel spreadsheets, which would take, uh, you know, hundreds, hundreds of man hours for one person to, for me to map out all of my crypto transactions, every single one of them. I'm just, I just don't, I'm not willing to do that. Right. So, uh, since the IRS doesn't give a hoot about your privacy, um, you're at their mercy, right? Unless you want to just like not declare your crypto transactions at all and keep everything private. Uh, yeah, that's on you if you want to try. But they also there's also a uh, a question on the IRS tax form: Have you? Uh, like right after you put in your name, you know, have you traded or owned or transferred any crypto during this tax year? And if you say no, and then they find out, you're going to get audited, right? And if you say yes, and then you don't include anything, then they're going to, you might get audited, right? So uh, it's perfectly safe. Uh, I don't, you're not, you're not putting your crypto at risk of hacking by revealing your private keys. You are compromising your privacy by doing so, but not really your security, unless you think of security in the sense that if someone knows your all, like if someone hacks into the Coinly software uh, or, you know, hacks into the uh, servers of your accountant or whatever and gets a hold of your crypto data and knows how much crypto you have and knows you have wallets with a lot of crypto in them, they might target you for personal 
uh, theft, right? So if, if they're a hacker slash robber, right? But usually those are two separate things. You got robbers and you got hackers. Hackers like to sit at home and hack other people's wallets and, and have the money pour into their wallets, right? They don't necessarily want to put on uh, black ski masks and go and break into someone's house and demand they give them their crypto. But you never know. A hacker might work with a gang and, you know, set, set people up. So, yeah, you are, in a sense, there, there's a chance that you could, that your data could fall into the wrong hands. It's, it's a possibility. But uh, that's a risk we take in this day's world, right? Is safe wallet safe? No, it's not safe. They should call it unsafe wallet. Uh, yeah, there's not much privacy left in today's world. And if you want to file your taxes then, and not make a mistake, soccer world, that's me. My blind, see, my blind sign seems to disable itself on occasion, even if I don't do anything. Uh, Dave D., what do you mean by blind sign? If you make 10 buys at various prices and then sell it all at once, you can list it as one transaction bought a various sold at a price. Okay, interesting. Yeah, I, when I talked with Andrew Gordon about, uh, you know, your capital gains tax forms, he told me that you have to include every single crypto transaction, every trade, every transfer, and the, you know, the tax form for your capital gains could be pages long, like eight, nine, 10, 20 pages long. Uh, I have no problem connecting to Exchange API to Tax API. My main concern is co connecting tax software to my long-term crypto storage wallet via API. Could be a backdoor. Well, they don't ask you to connect your uh, crypto wallet to an API. That's different, right? Usually what they're asking you to do is provide the public address of your wallet. And as I mentioned, that's not a security concern. API, uh, API is, is a software application programmer interface that runs on a centralized exchange, right? That's a separate thing from what you do with your wallets. Your wallets simply connect to their software by providing them the public address of your wallet. They can analyze the blockchain data and see all of your uh, crypto trades, and transfer. You don't trade in your wallet. Well, some wallets you trade in, but most of your wallet stuff, if it's just a ledger, is just trade transfers in and out. So there's no APIs going on there. You're just giving them the public information of your wallet, right? You can give them the public address of the wallet or what's called the XPUB address of a Bitcoin wallet. There are a couple other cryptos that have XPUB because, as I mentioned before, you have um, uh, sending addresses, and each time you send Bitcoin into the wallet, it's going to be a separate address. So uh, you can't just, you would have to give every single one of those to your uh, crypto tax software. So they have this thing within the wallet called the XPUB address which lumps all of your addresses together in one block. I don't believe that's the public key. I believe that's just kind of a formatted public uh, ledger of all of your public transactions. Pirate Chain, Monero, Darrow, whoops, privacy. Yeah, um, I'm a little unclear about how the tax, the IRS uh, would handle uh, Monero wallets because you can't just give someone your public address for a Monero wallet. It, it doesn't work like that. Um, there is no Monero blockchain explorer, right? You can't paste in somebody's public address and then look at all their transactions. Monero blocks that. So it seems like if you did, if you were a, a Monero user, and you wanted to pay your taxes, honestly, uh, you would have to sort of say, okay, look, I have a Monero wallet. You know, I withdrew the Monero that I bought from the exchange on this date. 
right? And then uh, on this date, I moved some Monero back from my wallet. Uh, and you could maybe put that address in there for the IRS to see, but they wouldn't be able to use the address to look at the, you know, the, to verify, right? So in that, in the case of Monero, then you would basically be, they would have to trust you. But like I said, the, the, the IRS trusts people for a lot of things. That's why they have you sign your form, right? It's you're, you're swearing to the government by virtue of signing the document that what you're telling them is true. And most of the time, they just simply trust you on it and act accordingly based on what you've told them. It's only when they suspect you're, being, you're not being honest with them that you might get audited and then they, they want to see receipts and that kind of stuff. So, yeah, there's, there's a lot of stuff on your tax return that's basically just you, they're trusting you to be reporting it honestly. So I'm assuming you could do that with your Monero wallet. You could say, okay, you know, I, I, I bought some Monero. That was a trade, right? And then I put it in my wallet. And then most of it is still in my wallet, but I did move some back, you know, uh, on this date and sold it. And that's, that was a trade, right? But, you know, uh, and, and, you know, also as far as, uh, as far as Monero goes, so let's just, or any crypto, as far as taxes go, if all you do is buy it, then you don't owe any money. You don't, that's not taxable. Just buying crypto is not taxable. Storing it in your own wallet is non-taxable. So if you have a Monero wallet or a Bitcoin wallet and you just buy Bitcoin on Coinbase with, uh, you know, cash on a regular basis or whatever and put it in your wallet, you don't have to worry about it to pay. You don't have to even tell them that you did that, right? That's just, it's only, a, it's only, you only need to divulge information to the uh, IRS about cryptos if you trade it, if you sell it and make a profit or a loss, you know. Uh, they really don't care about the losses. You don't even have to tell them about the losses. They don't care about those. They, they can benefit you if you declare your losses because it can help you. But they don't really care about what helps you, right? They just want to know what, how, what you made, right? So, yeah, I mean, it's not like a wash. Like you go, okay, well, I made, uh, you know, a, a thousand dollars on this Bitcoin trade and I lost a thousand on Ethereum. So we're even, right? And that's not how it works, right? They tax you uh, and everything. And, and, you know, your, your capital gains losses can be, you know, calculated in, but they still need to know when you make a profit. It has to be declared, right? Uh, there's a rumor that they're going to close down the IRS and just do a flat tax. Let's hope that happens. Ooh, that would be great. I think they've talked about that for quite a while, though. Uh, sending U.S. dollar coin is not a taxable transaction. You are not charged a fee. Use gas to send crypto. Gas is not a fee. It is data and nothing more. Uh, yeah, I don't really know. I mean, you're not, you're, but... Uh, I, when I was talking with Andrew Gordon, he mentioned that any use of crypto is a taxable event, even if you use it to buy a cup of coffee. So that would also entail you spending Ethereum out of your Ethereum wallet for a gas fee. That's spending your Ethereum. So if you bought that Ethereum uh, really cheap, and then when you used it for the gas fee, you spent it, you used it, that's a sale, basically. You have to account for that if there was a profit. So if you bought all your Ethereum really low a long time ago, and then you just have a, uh, an Ethereum wallet, and then you send some U.S. dollar coins somewhere, and you pay an Ethereum fee, that's, a, that's crypto. That's being used. Yeah, unfortunately, the IRS uh, counts every use of crypto whether you send it uh, to a friend, whether you use it to buy coffee, whether you use it to buy a computer, whether you use it to pay a gas fee, that's using your Ethereum, right? That's a, basically a sale. So whatever the price of Ethereum was, when you paid that $3 gas fee, you have to pay taxes on that 
if there was a profit. If that $3 of Ethereum for that gas fee only cost you $2.50 when you bought it a year ago, then you made a profit on that deal, right? So, yeah, uh, IRS is relentless. <laughs> Unfortunately, it is relentless. Uh, hey, Crypto Dad, will Trezor be supporting the new ETH hard fork called uh, Pulse Chain? Thanks. Uh, I don't know specifically, but yeah, I mean, every wallet has got to uh, support the upgrades. You know, whether they'll do it quickly or slowly is really the... But they don't have an option to simply ignore an upgrade in the, the way the a blockchain works, right? They've got to upgrade their... Uh, you know, uh, I'm trying to think. I mean, like the the new format of Ethereum, like a lot of the stuff that went with the, the old, the upgrade to the Ethereum network did not significant, not really significantly affect anyone that was just holding Ethereum in their wallet, right? There, there was some new functionality added under the hood, right? They went from proof of work to proof of stake, but it didn't affect my Ethereum wallet, right? My Ethereum wallet didn't just stop working because of that. Right? So there are certain things that can happen with Ethereum under the hood that really wouldn't make any difference at all to the way a wallet works. But, you know, I'm sure there are some things that, you know, need to be accounted for. Like, you know, uh, Cardano and Polkadot uh, are constantly having to update their apps because their code changes, their block co blockchain code. Scott Lee, ETH sucks. Yeah, they have to get, Scott had to get that one in. Uh, thanks, Joshua. I appreciate it. Uh, Paul Joseph, I love Coinly. Just FYI, does not support Cardano blockchain at this time. Everything needs to be done manually. Uh, yeah, I think I had that issue with... Um, coin tracker uh i because there is well it's not so much coin tracker or maybe even coinly but the cardano wallet doesn't have what we call an xpub address right so every brand new whenever you use like daedalus when you do a new uh transfer into your cardano wallet it generates a brand new sending address uh, in fact, Cardano wallets can have like, if you look over in, you know, the, the interface, there's hundreds of sending addresses that you can use in a Cardano wallet. And when I did my Coinly, I had to put in every single one of my, I had to go through my, because you can go into your wallet and see every transaction there. And I figured out a way to, I think I was just clicking them one by one and then putting and cutting and pasting the address into uh, Coin Tracker. It took me a while. I mean, it didn't. It wasn't. It wasn't impossible, but it was tedious and time consuming. But it didn't take me months. It took me like maybe a day or so to get it. Well, maybe just a couple of hours, really. Uh, and there were quite a few of them. But yeah, that's, I mean, when you say manually, I think what you, that's what you mean is that you have to put every single sending address one by one into your tax software. There's no way to just like link up the wallet connect, which would be very nice, right? If you could just say, here, connect my wallet to my tax software and just figure it all out for me, all right? Uh, got my Ledger Nano two years ago. Should I get a new one? Uh, if you don't use it that much, uh, there's really no problem. Uh, you do want to make sure that you keep the software updated, the Ledger Live software and your uh, firmware and all of your apps. Make sure they stay updated. Uh, I use my device pretty regularly, you know, almost daily. Uh, and my device got, uh, over time, it got kind of dim. And also the buttons where, you know, the oil on my skin uh, over time, uh, the device just kind of got a little bit grody. And uh, so I was ready for a new device, right? I, maybe I could have got out, you know, an alcohol cloth. But I think that it was actually wearing 
the front of it off a little bit, right? You could just, it was faded around the buttons. So I got a new one. Uh, you know, uh, the device is really not that big of a deal uh, as long as you have your backup phrase, right? The device is just the, the medium, right? So you can easily replace a device by uh, getting a new one and doing a restore. And then now you've got a mirror and you can just throw the old one away however you want to do it or beat it with a hammer so that no one else will get a hold of it if you want to throw it in the trash or however you want to do it. Or you can just do a factory reset on it and then just throw it in a drawer or throw it away, right, if it's old and you don't want to use it anymore. But two years, it just depends on how you use it, right? If you don't use it that often, it's probably in, still in pretty good shape, right? Uh, I was able to get Cardano, Cardano working on Coinly using staking key, but still sometimes buggy, but it works. Okay. Speak on self key. What's self key? Ooh. Your key to the metaverse is here. Your Web3 identity. Get the app. Oh my God, there's this creepy AI person like following my mouse cursor around like the Metamax, Metamask box. Uh, I'd have to look a little more into it. I see a lot of these. Uh, um, there's a lot of companies that you know, uh, it's, I, I've, if you recall, uh, back in the uh, late 90s, early 2000s, there were a lot of firms that uh, jumped on the internet bandwagon and put like, uh, I can't remember what it was. I think it was like the, the word uh, internet or dot com at the end of their business name or something like that, and their stocks just shot up, and it was all just window dressing, right? That was like a the the big like scam in the you know the the when the dot com bubble burst, right? So this whole Web three thing, I'm all for it. It's great. Um, it's the next step on the internet. But there's a lot of companies that are just jumping out there with, oh, you know, we're the key to, to the, the Web3 starts here. We're, you know, the, we're your Web3 headquarters or whatever. And I see, I see this all the time. So just looking at this selfkey.org on the surface of it, I, I don't know. I'd have to play around with it a little more. But it looks interesting, right? Digital sovereignty. There's a lot of great stuff going on in Web3. Uh, you know, uh, utilizing blockchain and cryptography uh, for a decentralized um, paradigm, if you will, paradigm, where uh, we can maintain our digital sovereignty. Uh, I remember thinking a long time ago, um, well, like let's say back in 2017, there were all of these scandals where Finally, people realize that, uh, that Facebook and Gmail and Google were not products. You know, we were products, right? We were the product. They were harvesting our personal information and getting rich doing it, right? All of these free services out there were basically harvesting our digital information so most, most of the time anonymously, but they were making use of our demographics, right? Where we were coming from, what we were buying, you know, uh, who we were chatting with, how often we were chatting, when we chatted, when we didn't chat, you know, all that stuff was demographic information that they were selling to advertisers and stuff. So that was the centralized thing. We finally realized that, hey, this whole centralized thing, we're giving up our privacy, we're giving up our sovereignty, we're giving up our data for free, and they're getting rich. And I thought to myself, wow, uh, I could, wouldn't it be great if we could, if you could figure out a way for the companies to pay us for our information? I mean, after all, it is our information, right? Shouldn't they be paying us to use our information? Well, maybe Web3 is our answer, right? 
if we can do a decentralized thing, and there's a lot of decentralized uh, like social media things going on now where uh, there is no centralized server and people can't get uh, deplatformed or censored. There's a lot of great stuff going on, right? So uh, this self key might be one of them. I don't know. Could be. Maybe not. <laughs> Could be. Maybe not. Who knows, right? There's a lot of wannabes, uh, not, uh, not outright scam, but wannabes, right? Let's put you know, Web 3.0 on our, uh, on our uh, company name and people will think we're great and hot and hip and uh, we'll try and do something with that. We'll hire some young guys that know programming and we'll try to get in on this Web 3 thing, right? But they don't really, you know, know what it's all about or have a huge plan behind it. They just want to jump on the bandwagon. So there's a lot of that, right? There's a lot of innovative, great stuff going on. And then there's a lot of wannabes. And then there's a lot of scammers that are just taking advantage of it to try and uh, profit by scamming people. So uh, you have to be really careful in today's world. Uh, how do I set up a 24 word without using the internet or being online? Uh, there is a, uh, several ways you can do that. Uh, there's a website. Uh, can I, can I, <laughs> can I add to this? How can I like, uh, yeah, I don't even know how to chat. Wait, let me tap on this. Is there a way for me to chat in this? <laughs> I don't know what the hell I'm doing here. Uh, the, I, the camera, I can't do that. All right, there's this little thing. Okay, no, that's just... Anyway, uh, there is a, a website called BIP39 where you can go and uh, it will generate 24-word uh, keys for you. And... Um, you can download that software and disconnect your computer from the internet and run it in your web browser, totally disconnected from the internet to generate a 24 word key. Sorry about that. But there is also this little thing here. Uh, this is called an Ellipol Joy. And the Ellipol Joy will generate. Press OK to generate. OK, so what's OK? Is it this thing? Whoops. OK, and then you can choose how many words you want. I haven't played with this thing in a while. All right, and then it just generates a, a phrase for you. All right. I, I don't know how to use Oh, there's a plus on this side. Okay. All right, there's a plus and a minus. All right. So you can generate a phrase, right? You can uh, go up. Yes. No. Okay, yeah, I'm doing it, right? <laughs> you can change it to 24, and then you can say OK, and it'll generate a 24-word phrase for you. I forget how much this thing is. It's pretty cool. Uh, so this is a way that you can do a seed phrase completely offline if you trust the circuitry of this. You can also generate a seed phrase by rolling dice if you want to do that. It's possible, right? There's a 2,048-word uh, seed phrase. Although there is a checksum, so I don't know if uh, rolling the dice will give you a valid seed phrase or not. Have I lost my chat here? What did I do? Now I can't seem to get back into this thing. Come on, Rex. What are you doing? <sighs> okay, there. I went away. Ugh. 
Am I still here? <laughs> because I can't get rid of this stupid thing. Okay. It won't go away. Okay. There it went. It keeps popping up. I can't. Oh, my God. I'm too old for this. Why won't I? Why can't I get rid of this stupid thing? Cancel. Cancel. Go away. All right. There it disappeared. And as soon as I tap my screen, it comes right back. I can't get back into the chat. Nope. <laughs> oh, my God. I'm way too old for this. Come on, Rex. Please get back to it. How do you get back? Hello? <laughs> God. Well, I appear uh, apparently I'm still on, but I can't see the chat anymore. I don't know what I did. I was playing around with my phone trying to share a link with you guys and now okay i'm still live but i can't see the chat window anymore unfortunately i don't know what happened wow okay oh my god this is unbelievable <laughs> uh. Wow. Okay. I don't know what I did, but now I can't see the chat anymore. Top chat. Okay, there it goes. Oh, my God. Jeez. Okay. Sorry. I'm just not used to using this phone thing. Okay, good. You can hear me. Uh, hello, is there anybody out there? Just not if you can hear me. <laughs> Jimmy C., you used to listen to Pink Floyd with your headphones on when you were a sophomore in high school like I did? Open YouTube on your desktop to chat. Uh, I'm okay. I, I got it back. There, there was like a, a thing that I, I was trying to... I still can't figure out how to add... Oh, open YouTube on my desktop to chat? Okay. That'd be weird. Let's see here. If I do this, I know, but it would be it'd be weird that it's not. Okay, yeah. So it has me here. Uh, yeah. I I. Oh, oh. Okay, I got you. Thank you, Dan. Okay. Uh, let's see. Okay, here we go. How's that? There we go. Yay! I figured out how to paste the link in. You can go there and uh, generate a, a seed phrase. Are we back to this again? Okay. Use your computer to see the chat if you need it. Okay, I am. I can see it now. What are your thoughts on XPT Global? They are big in the XT and coming to the U.S. in March. Love it when I see other Michiganders representing the crypto space. XPT Global, huh? Oh, I got an error message. Oh, I see. Uh, it's like a car.
<laughs> Thanks, Jimmy C. Tap global XP, XTP. Global X. Global XTP. Okay. Okay. Uh, it's a currency? A crypto? XTP. Are you talking about tap? Oh, tap. Okay, tap. Uh, I thought that uh, TAP was um, associated with um, basic attention token or the Brave browser. Uh, I believe TAP was uh, in partnership with Brave to allow people to spend their basic attention token that they were earning in their browser. Um, I haven't heard a lot about it. It didn't really take off, but it is. Uh, it would be great if it did, in the sense that it's a really good for crypto adoption for people to be able to earn crypto uh, in their browser and then spend it in the real world using Tap. Um, yeah. So yes, I have heard of TAP, but it looks like they've rebranded themselves a little bit. Uh, their logo looks a little different, but I've heard of TAP. Yeah, they've, they've been partnered with Brave for quite a while there. It was always kind of a potential. So, you know, we'll see. I mean, uh, basic attention token was groundbreaking. Right. I don't know uh, if you uh, were around when Brave first came out, but when Brave first came out, it ran on Bitcoin. Uh, Brave browser was like if you it was like if you watched, you could earn Bitcoin using the Brave browser. Right. Uh, I guess that didn't work out because of the volatility of Bitcoin or whatever. So they revamped it and changed it and came up with their own utility token called Basic Attention Token, B-A-T. Uh, and the idea is that if you uh, allow your, basically you're, you're uh, uh, allowing yourself to earn BAT by getting targeted advertising. That's how the end user can earn BAT. The uh, a content creator could earn BAT uh, by having a website or a YouTube channel where people uh, put them in their list within the uh, Bat browser, uh, the Brave browser, so that uh, if a certain number of people were following a particular content creator, that content creator was earning Bat token from those uh, viewers or users, right? So there was two ecosystems, right? There was, there's a way for the end user to earn bat token, and there's a way for content creators to earn bat token as well. And you would earn it within the brave browser. Uh, and then you could use your bat tokens in conjunction with tap, uh, to like earn credits towards certain products, right? Tap was, tap is kind of like gift cards in a way, all right? So you could earn like $10 to certificate for Nordstrom's and using tap, something like that, all right? Can I, can I log into, oh, FTX. I earned quite a bit with the Brave ads and getting bat tips as a Brave creator. Yes, I did too, actually. Uh, back in the early days, like the two, the 18, I was earning a phenomenal amount of, uh, bat. Uh, I wish I hadn't sold it all, but, uh, 
back then, you know, I was, you know, I wasn't a rich man. And so every month when I would get my bat, it would be a couple hundred bucks. I would generally, I would sell it and use it right for, to, for stuff I wanted and needed. Geomagnetic storms and CME coronal mass injections along with solar flares have direct effects on earth weather. Sorry, I'm not into that stuff. <laughs> uh, just swap mine for Ethon uphold. Yeah, that's another way. Yeah, the only way you could get paid in bat as a content creator was by using uphold. The, the brave browser would send your bat directly into uphold. Um, I don't know that I believe for a while there, there was no way to, uh, withdraw bat directly out of brave. If you were earning bat within your brave browser, there was no way to withdraw it directly as a crypto to your own wallet. You, uh, had to spend it within the browser or, uh, if, you know, you, you could send it to Uphold and then from Uphold you could sell it. But that was your only out, right? They only worked with one uh, outgoing thing, right? They, that was the only way to cash out your bat was through Uphold. And you had to provide KYC for Uphold, right? It would have been nice if you could simply, you know, you, the, you had a bat wallet built into your Brave browser that you could withdraw, but you couldn't. <laughs> uh, let's see, here we doing? I think. Okay. It was a question someone had in your chat, CryptoDad. Sorry to distract. Oh, I only know how to use Coinbase, but I, but I do use Brave browser. Okay. Can I address FTX and how to deal with for tax purposes? You know what? Uh, I'm not sure uh, how uh, the IRS deals with money that you've lost um, outright, uh, but I would assume that it would they would use your cost basis. So if you bought. Uh, a bunch of Bitcoin on FTX and then FTX went bankrupt, uh, you could some, you might be able to, uh, you could probably recreate the uh, records from your end by using your bank records or things like that to prove to the IRS that I bought this on this day and time. I don't know, uh, but I mean, if you invest money and it and the company goes bankrupt, I'm that's not a new thing, right? That's that's been around for years. So I'm sure there's a way that on your tax taxes that you can account for money that you've lost or invested in companies that went bankrupt. The only problem is that with FTX there, there may not be a resolution to uh, the bankruptcy uh, for a while there. So you're kind of, your investment is kind of in limbo. You, now, you might get compensated in the end, uh, down the road, maybe a few years down the road. And at that point, then you can claim a loss. Like if they say, okay, we're going to give you 10% of what you had in there. Yeah, I am wearing pajamas. You know, I'm thinking, uh, I, I wear a, a nice shirt, but I usually wear my pajamas. And I'm thinking, I'll bet all the newscasters are wearing pajamas too, and all the sportscasters. I know they were during COVID, that's for sure. Uh, these are cool uh, pajama bottoms, though. These are Harley Davidson uh, flannel pajama bottoms. Got them at the Harley Davidson Museum in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Yeah, at least I'm wearing pants, right? That that would be uh, problematic if I wasn't wearing pants. <laughs> Some were only wearing shirts, right? Yeah. I wear a onesie. <laughs> yeah, I have uh, a couple of pairs of, of flannel pajama bottoms. Uh, I've got a pair of Michigan Wolverine uh, plaid 
pajama bottoms too, which I like. Um, I remember we went uh, down to visit my parents in Texas uh, for Christmas in 2021. And our first stop was Louisville, Kentucky. And uh, we were up in our hotel room and they didn't have room service because it was still kind of COVID nonsense still going on. So uh, I, they didn't have room service, but you could go down to the lobby and get some coffee. So I went down to the lobby to get some coffee in the morning and I was wearing my Michigan pajama bottoms and my slippers standing in line at the coffee li down there at the coffee shop at the hotel. And so the person in front of me kind of turned around and looked down at me and uh, go, oh, Michigan fan, eh? <laughs> I was like, yeah, yeah, I'm from Michigan. <laughs> that was funny. <laughs> I'm not from the UP. I'm from Fort Wayne, Indiana originally, and right now I live in Grand Rapids. But we've been to the UP. It's beautiful. We uh, took a trip up to uh, Marquette, Michigan, in uh, 2020, I think we did. The year of the COVID, we took a trip. Yeah. Yeah, it was weird. Yeah, well, what was what was messed up about it was they're like, we stayed there, I think we were there for like four or five days. And they're like, well, because of COVID, we're not, we can't come in and clean your room. I was like, what do you mean you can't clean my room, you know? <laughs> don't, don't your, your maids can wear masks and gloves, right? And they're coming in and disinfecting. But no, no, they, they were like, oh, uh, we no longer clean your rooms. And they kind of stuck to that, too. I think most hotels are like that now. We don't clean your rooms while you're there. If you're there for five days, tough. You know, we won't come in and change your bed sheets or anything. And that's like the attraction of the hotel, right, to me. It's like you go stay at a, a resort for a week. You want to leave your room and go out and party. And when you come back, have clean sheets and a clean room. And now they're like, oh, no, COVID policies. We can't send a maid in there to clean your room now. <laughs> Youpers and trolls. Oh, no. Well, I'm not a youper, so I must be a troll. <laughs> uh, Ada Sync problem, Ledger Live XLM2. Yeah, I was talking earlier about my Bitcoin wallet not syncing. It was really distressing to me. For such a long time, uh, it, it seemed like a whole month that wallet wasn't synced up right. It was telling my balance was way off, and I knew it was. In fact, you know what I did? I imported that 24-word uh, recovery phrase from my ledger into my uh, Trezor, in my Trezor T. And after I did that and connected my Trezor T to the Trezor Suite, the wallet balance showed up properly. Go figure. So I, I don't know if it was a... Well, it was obviously kind of a ledger server issue syncing up to the blockchain, not the blockchain itself, because Trezor had no problem syncing up the wallet properly. And I could go on the, the blockchain explorer and put in the address of the wallet and get an accurate balance. So I don't know what was going on with uh, Ledger Live. Um, I know that, well, I'm, I'm assuming that it's somewhat centralized, right? That Ledger Live can, doesn't sync directly to the blockchain without first passing through the Ledger servers. I could be wrong about that. I, I don't see why they, Ledger Live shouldn't just sync directly to the blockchain like any other wallet would, right? Electrum Bitcoin wallet. Monero wallet, um, well, there's a, a MetaMask wallet, a lot, well, actually MetaMask has, also has a third party uh, consents, consents that they use uh, as their Ethereum node, so MetaMask is somewhat, uh, also is centralized in that respect when it gets its data. So yeah, maybe that's the problem is that Ledger is somewhat centralized and uh, they're running this fine balance between, well, how much bandwidth can and servers can we provide and still be making money as a company, 
right? Because they could go out and buy, you know, all the top servers and, you know, spend millions of dollars to upgrade their servers. But then are they going to be making any money if they do that? Right, so they, they need just enough servers to be functional. Let's talk about Ravencoin. Well, I don't know a lot about Ravencoin. I've heard of it. Uh, I've, I understand that it is proof of work coin. Uh, I know that the people that like Ravencoin uh, swear by it and believe by it. I'm pretty sure Ravencoin is still a proof of work coin. Uh, I think there were a lot of people that were uh, mining Ethereum, you know, uh, hobbyists and home users that had like GPU rigs that when Ethereum went to proof of stake, they switched over to r mine Ravencoin. So it, it is viable in that sense. That is one of the few, uh, you know, viable proof of work coins that uh, someone in their home can uh efficiently mine i guess efficiently is is uh, maybe not the best word for it because mining is not you know a money tree mining requires a lot of intensive uh effort on your part technical know-how um capital upfront investment in equipment uh higher power bills all that kind of stuff so it's it's uh i don't know that you would call that efficient uh, but you might call it like reasonably viable uh, in that you could generate some income mining Ravencoin with your GPU rigs, right? Uh, I don't know about the price action of Ravencoin. I know Ravencoin's been around a long time. Um, it's not some fly-by-night crypto. It's been around for a while. Um, Scott, Ooh, the entire crypto market is manipulated. I just purchased XRP, Theta, Lunk, Eek, but not going to dump it beginning May, not financial advice. Yeah. Well, I can't help but think that there are forces that are manipulating the crypto market, as is, you know, the, the stock market and the gold market uh, being manipulated. Um, I don't know, you know, the word manipulated makes it sound rinky-dink, but we're talking about institutional, you know, it's like baked into the system, right? That the people at the top kind of control things, even though like the Libor bank scandal, uh, that when the, you know, they were catching the banks that were manipulating the uh, exchange rate of gold on the, the open market, there were, there were uh, precious metal traders were uh, in collusion with each other from different companies to manipulate the price of uh, currencies. Yeah, that's institutional misbehavior. And that kind of stuff is illegal, but basically they just got slaps on the wrist and paid fine and chalked it up to the cost of doing business, right? Nobody ended up in jail, right? So there is manipulation in the system on a grand scale. And it's only natural that uh, now that there's big uh, people are taking note of Bitcoin, that there aren't big, deep-pocketed entities that are manipulating the market. It, w it wouldn't be that difficult. I mean, if they can manipulate trillion-dollar gold markets and, you know, multi-million-dollar stock markets, they're not going to have too much trouble with, you know, the crypto market, which is basically less than a trillion overall, you know, so, but, we, you know, it's nothing that, you know, we can put our finger on, but it's not, and not out of the realm of the possibility in any way or form. How many Lambos do you own? Well, I, I should, I should have bought Lambo when I had a chance. Uh, I did have a pretty uh, nice looking portfolio in 2021, um, and I'm not complaining uh, but I did hope that it was going to keep going up from there, and it didn't. So uh, a lot of those uh, gains were never realized, but quite a few of them were along the way. Um, we, uh, you know, I've got a great rig. Uh, my wife and I, we both have laptops. The kids all have rigs. Um, you know, life is pretty good. Um, been sending my kids to uh, private school. Uh, so I can't complain. 
but I didn't buy a Lambo. Used to take a week and a half or two uh, show use sats used to show progress. BTC Lambo. Whoops. I drive a 76 Plymouth Volare. Not bragging, just saying. <laughs> Isn't that the one? Who was that one that sang Volare? Volare. Whoa. That was like a, a song from the 60s, I, I think. Oh, sure. Raven coins. A good coin. Didn't know that about Lieber. We'll research it. Yeah, there. Uh, let me see if I can uh, paste a link. We uh, we talked about it in the live stream uh, a while back because it was in the news. Uh, but there's there's like a little explainer about what it was and what it entailed. But that's like a mainstream overview of it, right? Usually, you know, these these horrible scams where, you know, these people are manipulating the financial market for their own gains, uh, they kind of get glossed over. You know, the, uh, the SNL loan scandal of the early 90s, the uh, housing bubble market, uh, of 2008 financial crisis, most of this, these were blatant uh, fraud on the part of major banks, and they never got punished. So, I mean, it's not surprising uh, that the system is still being manipulated because the, these, the, well, I'll have to admit that the, the, the SNL banking scam, people went to jail back then. Uh, that was during the presidency of George uh, Herbert Walker Bush, uh, people did go to jail, but not everybody, but there were some people that went to jail over the SNL scandal, but I don't believe anybody went to jail, uh, over the 2008 financial crisis. And there were huge fraud of banks, uh, foreclosing robo, robo signing mortgages. And I mean, there was just all kinds of heinous, shenanigans going on on the part of big banks, people uh, gambling with other people's money, outright fraud um, that were never really punished. No one ever went to jail. A lot of fines got paid. You know, oh yeah, I made $10 billion last year. I had to pay a billion dollar fine. Ah, man, I lost 10%. But they still had their Lambos and their mansions. The big short, yeah, if you look at that. He saw, yeah, he saw the outright fraud that was going on. If you had a pulse, you got a loan, right? I remember those commercials were just like 24-7. Now it's all pharma, pharma commercials. Like you watch, I don't ever, I don't watch TV anymore. Uh, everything I have is streaming now. But when I'm at somebody's house or at my parents sometimes and we're watching cable, like every commercial is about uh, some new pharma drug. But back in the, you know, mid 90s, like every commercial was, you know, mortgage, you know, refinance your house, get a get a mortgage, you know, oh, Milkman, Milken went to jail. Yeah, that was think his his one thing. Right. But I mean, there were a lot of big banks involved in the 2008 financial crisis that there were people there should have gone to jail, not just one guy. I don't know about what Milken, I think Milken was involved in outright fraud. Bill Clinton's social engineering plan, Community Reinvestment Act, directly responsible for ultimate mortgage meltdown. A lot of stuff happened during the Bill Clinton. Oops. <laughs> Please go away. Okay. <laughs> yeah. uh, the 1996 uh, Telecommunications Act signed under Bill Clinton was another one. Uh, let's see here. Uh, 
Yeah, the 1996 Telecommunications Act signed into law by Bill Clinton uh, is largely responsible for the media consolidation that we have today, right? Okay, Scott's heading out. Thanks for being here, Scott. I appreciate it. Thanks for being here, JDO. Uh, thanks for being here, Dan. I'm probably going to go ahead and sign on out. I appreciate everybody bearing with me on this thing. I guess I'm just going to have to, you know, hard press my uh, ISP to get somebody out here to take a look at what's going on with my... It could be, you know, I don't know. Uh, I've been through a couple of Michigan winners, but... I know that the cable line that leads to my modem is comes from a green box out in my front yard and it snakes along the ground and goes behind the house and in my, you know, office window. So, uh, there could be something going on out there, you know, with all this inclement weather we've been having. Uh, let's see, what do we, whoops. Polk City Metaverse. Okay. Okay, here we go. Oh, okay. Haven't heard about Polk City Metaverse before. Uh, there's uh, this kind of a crowded sector, right? There's a lot of NFT games. Um, you know, uh, that was supposed to be the big thing back in 2020 and 2021 was the uh, Metaverse gaming industry. Um, as it turned out, uh, the, the traditional gaming community rejected uh, NFT based games they felt like you know trying to like integrate NFTs into uh, traditional games was a corruption of how gaming worked um, so th that was one of the big hurdles or uh, that the, the gaming, the crypto NFT gaming and or blockchain based gaming industry ran into was gamers, the true gaming community, the, the bulk of normal gaming people rejected NFT gaming. And so, uh, you know, up to that time, there was a lot of hype about blockchain based nft gaming how it was going to take over the industry and it was the next great thing and people were buying coins if they just said they were involved in gaming and the values of these coins were shooting up and then uh nft gaming was rejected by the the mainstream gaming community and you got to understand that the gaming industry is a billion dollar industry if not trillion uh and they rejected NFT gaming. Now, NFT gaming didn't just roll over and die, but it didn't take off the way we all thought it was going to take off. And in fact, some I, I was involved in one, and I don't want to bag on it, but it was uh, called Alice... Uh, I can't remember the name of it, Alice Home or something, but it, it was basically like uh, Animal Crossing, where you bought plots of land and then you developed them and then there were real crypto tokens that you could earn within the, my neighbor Alice. Thank you. Uh, and I tried playing it, but it was like way overcrowded and the game itself wasn't really that engaging. Uh, there was a lot of, oh, you, you know, buy this, buy this plot of land, have your very own plot of land. But when it come, it came to 
the game itself, it really was a little kind of lame compared to, you know, like uh, Call of Duty or, uh, you know, Skyrim or, you know, any kind of like game that you would want to engage in uh, with high end graphics. Like my neighbor Alice was just like real clunky and, you know, and I was like, and also, uh, what was the other one? Um, oh, let me see if I can figure this one out here real quick. I'm looking at my ledger here. Mana, mana. Okay, yeah. Decentralized mana, right? Decentraland. Have you actually played that game? It's not that engaging, if you ask me. Uh, not very advanced, right? It's just, like you said, it's, it's the, it's, we're in the Atari uh, section. And so if you... There's nothing wrong with the crypto gaming industry, but I don't see it as being like a quick get rich quick thing, right? It it's going to be years before it you know anything comes of it. That's my opinion, right? So this one, this Polk City is another one I've never heard of before jumping into this space, right? This already saturated space of crypto gaming. This looks like yeah, you buy your own stuff and yeah, that's what it looks like to me. You know, you buy a plot of land and then you buy vehicles and you know, the multiverse experience. Another one. Yeah. Anyway, guys, uh, thanks for uh, hanging in there with me. Uh, sorry for all the technical difficulties. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and sign off for tonight and uh, probably post some uh, videos that I'll upload this week and see if I can't figure out if I can figure out what's wrong with my ISP. Uh, you know, it might be something that will just resolve itself. If, you know, it'll just go away, whatever the problem is. They might fix it on their end. We'll see. <laughs> but have a great night. Uh, don't forget, I'll do this on Saturday at 6 p.m., uh, God willing. <laughs> so uh, good to see you guys tonight. I don't know how to stop. <laughs> good night. Are you sure I want to stop streaming? Yeah, I want to end. Thanks, Dan. Thanks, JDO.